Guys, last week we, I told you, for those who said, if this is your first time, let me catch you up. We've been doing a whole focus on prayer for the year, and my, um, my focus last week was on a prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden, right in between the Last Supper and his betrayal. All right, this is the, the famous Judas kiss that he has, and, and he's arrested, and then just a sequence of events, and before you know it, a couple, um, for not, not too much long after that, he's on the cross. But we were looking at this prayer because there was something interesting in this prayer. We're going to read the verse again, but look at a different angle. Last week, we focused on the apostles and the disciples that were with Jesus, and how Jesus told them to pray for certain reasons, and we put the whole focus on, on them because there was two things happening. They were praying for a purpose and for a reason. And then Jesus was also praying for a similar but a different one. And something happened differently to him than them. And so we're going to shift our focus on this one today. But um, just to kind of pull in the theme of everything. You know, this week is uh, the beginning of Holy Week. This is a uh, time in which the Jews celebrate Passover. For those of you, if you don't know your history or how they even that's, or, or your Bible, this is something that has been celebrated for, I want to say, going on 3,500 years-ish or so. And it all started in Exodus. If you've ever seen uh, the Moses story, right? The parting of the Red Sea, all of these things. That Passover started on there because it was something in which God delivered his people out of slavery. And the reason it was called Passover is because on the last night, they were supposed to sacrifice a lamb and then put the blood on the doorpost. I know some of you guys are already being traumatized. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. And there was a reason for it. Watch. They put the blood on the doorpost. And that the angel of death was supposed to come over this place because this place had become wicked. The king, the pharaoh, had, had his heart in his heart. And those in which the blood was on top, it, the angel of death would pass over. And those that it wasn't, the firstborn in that house would die. Now, some of that, again, you got to be able to read. It's sometimes hard to read something that happened 3,000 years ago with 2023 20, eyes. Right? Because we look at that and be like, what kind of not? You invited me to this. What are we doing? And you're like, no, I'm, I'm sorry. If somebody starts bringing chickens out, I'm done. I, I know. Listen. And it was weird. I know. I get it. But everything had a rhyme and reason. Because even in the Old Testament, there was a symbol of things. By the way, interesting enough, Passover, right? There was what animal had to be sacrificed but a, an innocent lamb. It was a lamb that had to be sacrificed, a perfect one, and that the whole family had to embrace sin. The blood was put on the doorpost, and we had to, I had to paint a doorpost this week, all right? Guys, well, how many, when you want to do a doorpost, what is the geometrical figure of it? You have a vertical post and a horizontal post. Blood had to be on a vertical and a horizontal post. There's a cross there. And then if you had the blood, it would pass over you, and you would have life. You would not die, but have eternal life at the cost of the firstborn. Jesus being the firstborn among many. So it's really interesting how all of those things tie in. And so ever since then, the Jews would celebrate Passover. And this is what we call the Last Supper. You know, we've seen the pictures with Jesus, right? You know, over there in the middle. Like everyone's arguing and Jesus is like, calm down, guys, calm down. It's Leonardo, you know, whatever is, what's the name? Da Vinci. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci's. Um, situation. There's another Leonardo that threw me off right now. And so you'll see. Because, uh, and in the Passover ceremony, as they celebrated year after year, they had cups in which there were purposes for these cups. Jesus would use these things. We're going to celebrate communion also today. So online you can run and get something because we're going to celebrate communion today. And in those cups, Jesus would raise a glass and the, whoever was the host of that Passover Seder would raise a glass and say a declaration before they all partook. So this is why I got confused with the Leonardo da Vinci because there's another Leonardo with a glass. This is a famous meme. You guys have seen this picture before. You want to put it up. Um, I want you to have this image, okay? So this is why I see, see, I had a reason why I got confused with Leonardo da Vinci because it was DiCaprio. It's going to mess me up. So this is a famous, you know, famous meme there, right? Raising a glass for a toast. And so Jesus would kind of do those things, and, and I actually titled the sermon today, you know, Raise Your Glass, It's Time to Praise. You'll see why uh, by the end. Um, but normally when somebody raises a glass, there's that speech, right? Jesus gave a few of those. We're going to look at one in particular. And um, it's all connected together. And so right as Jesus, okay, right as Jesus raises his glass and he says something, they sing a song, and then they leave and they go to the garden. 
And now here is, we're going to pick up the story where we left off. There's three places you can read it, all a little different. Matthew and Mark are very similar. Luke is a little different. Matthew and Mark tend to put a lot more detail on what the apostles and, and, and disciples were feeling and experiencing. But Luke puts the focus more on Jesus. And so that's what we're going to look at today. So can we put, let's go to Luke chapter 22. Oops, I passed it. Luke 22, right? Is it on there? Luke 22. And we're going to read what happens to, oh no, that's a little past 22. I didn't save my spot this morning. All right, 26. It's there. I promise you guys, it's in Luke. All right. All right, there it is. Oh, I was right. Luke 22. Okay. Luke 22, 39 through 46. Here we are. Let's see this. So he being Jesus went out and made his way as usual to the Mount of Olives, which Mark and Matthew called Gethsemane. All right. That's the name of it. And the disciples followed him. When he reached that place, he told them, pray that you may not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away, another English phrase, in earshot, meaning he distanced himself just enough, but he's still close enough that they can hear what he's saying. He, he distanced himself, he withdrew about a stone and throws away, knelt down and began to pray. And this is what he prayed. Father, and then Mark would say, Abba, Father. I mean, there was this deep cry to his father. Here we go, Abba, Father, if you are willing... Take this cup away from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Being in anguish, look at how he's feeling, in anguish, deep sorrow. He prayed, what's the word there? Even more fervently. As the pressure increased, he pressed in even more. He prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples. He found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. And the grief was, again, they were grieving, seeing Jesus grieving, and they couldn't handle it anymore. So I was like, I got I to gotta take a nap. I got to go to bed. I, I can't deal with this anymore. We've all been there. So he asked them, why are you sleeping? He asks, get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. And that's the end of that story. Now, Matthew and Mark have a different uh, a focus. Matthew and Mark emphasize the fact that how many, for those of us that were here last week, how many times did Jesus repeat this pattern? Three times. So Luke doesn't put that there. Luke really kind of gives a summary. You know, he kind of gives the, the, the essence of it and puts this focus on. He really wanted us to see what Jesus was going through. I mean, look at that, the sweat and the stress uh, looks like blood, and it is blood. And so three times he goes and he prays and he wakes them up. He goes and prays again, wakes them up. He goes and prays. Finally, the third time, he's like, all right, it's time. My betrayer is near. Judas and a mob of about, some estimate to be about a thousand people, pull up in this private garden, take Jesus. And then from there on out, there's the trial, the crucifixion, and uh, that's the rest of the story. So, but let's look at this. So, in this, um, when we look at Jesus, what is stressing him out? All right? What is stressing him out? We all know we've all been there. We've all been stressed out about, about something. Maybe for some of us, we were stressed out about what? Maybe it was that test that we had going on. I was like, you wake up that day, and the teacher's like, all right, Aaron, clear your desk. Oh, that's like, you know, your, 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 your heart sinks to the, the pit of your stomach. We we're like, wait, what test? Right? What test? As a teacher, listen, I used to do that all the time. I, I, I don't know. All right, all right, guys, time for the test. Never fails. Some kid in the back. What test? And I was waiting for that guy. I was like, oh, what test? And then I would walk over to the board and point to where it said a test that I wrote down two weeks ago, Johnny, that I told you yesterday you were going to have. Look at right there. And we go, I didn't know. I was like, you, I told you. We talked about this yesterday. Oh, it was so frustrating. And so anyway, so all the teachers out there, mad love to you guys. I've been there. I know, still am. Anyways. So, all right. Here's the thing. As he's, um, as he's looking at this, what is stressing him out? Maybe for some of you, it's that. Maybe it's first week on the job, all right? It's a lot of stress going on. First week on the job. Maybe, you know, a relationship, maybe financial, big decision. We've all been there, right? When we have stressed out, what is freaking Jesus out so much? First off, you saw what it was. What's freaking him out? There's a cup. There's a cup that's freaking him out. 
Now, for some of you, especially, let's say if you're a Christian, can, can you pause for a minute and look at what he was saying. Over and over again, he would say things like, Lord, if you are willing, take this cup, what? Away. Take this cup away. I mean, it almost sounds like, it, it sounds like Jesus is having cold feet. All right. I don't know if you've ever, you know, some of you, if you've been married, you've had that. Some of you probably had cold feet. Maybe some of you didn't. For all the people married in the house online, tell me if you have. You know what I'm talking about? For those of you that have gone to that, the, the night before you're going to get married, isn't that like, whoo, okay, this is happening. This is go time. This is happening. This is, this is happening. I couldn't sleep that night. I mean, I was just awake. All right. I wasn't having cold feet. My wife's not here right now. I'm like saying, wait, she's not finding out things 16 years later. All right. I wasn't having cold feet. We talked about this. She couldn't sleep neither. I'm going to say, you know, you got them pregame jitters. If you're that athlete, right, you know, right, at the beginning, you're nervous. It's like exciting but scary. And, and that's what I was feeling, you know, that night. I'm like, this is it. Like, till death do us part. Till, till death. Till death do us part. I those are crazy phrases, you know. Oh, my gosh, what is this? And so, you know, I, I didn't have that cold feet like that. Like, I wasn't second-guessing it. But the weight of the decision was was there. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Like you're really feeling, I was like, oh my gosh. Is he, is Jesus having second thoughts? Because he knows what's about to show up. He knows that there's a cross before him. What is he so scared of? What is he so scared of? And it, does he look like he's like, listen, dad, uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm having second thoughts about this. You know, you, you got another game plan. You know, was he hoping that God the father was going to call an audible and switch things up? You know, you, you, you got something else cooking up in there, man. Can we figure this out? Is there another way? Is there another way? When we look at this, it almost seems like he's reluctant. He's not sure anymore, but he's not. I'm here to encourage you and, and to show you he is not. In fact, those of us that we've been here for the last couple of weeks, we looked at the prayer that Jesus prayed that night. In John 17, that night, Jesus prayed the greatest prayer ever prayed. We talked about it for three weeks. And in the greatest prayer ever prayed, Jesus was confident. He knew, Father, I know in your plan, you are a righteous Father. This is not some weird, you know, sick plan that you're going to come up with to torture me, to bother me. I'm that guy. My, my middle son is that guy where I would do things just to mess with you because it's fun to mess with you. You got that kid, you got that spouse who just loves to push the buttons and just, yeah, yeah, you know, okay. That God's not like that. God's not, oh, I got, Holy Spirit, I got something for Jesus. Watch this. Oh, he, oh it's going to be funny. Like, he's not enjoying this. But we know that that night when Jesus was praying, he was confident in the Father. He knew Jesus wasn't afraid of dying. Because we see in John 17, he wasn't afraid of dying. He wasn't afraid of men. He wasn't afraid of the cross. He wasn't afraid of being tortured. He wasn't afraid of, is, is the Father going to resurrect me from the dead? He wasn't afraid of any of that. In John 17, we see he is confident. So what is freaking him out? It's interesting that in, in Matthew and Mark, we, we don't see it here. But he gives a reason why the apostles should pray. He said, pray so you don't fall into temptation. And he gives a reason. He says, because the Spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. All of us, if you've never read the Bible before, you know that feeling. You know what that's true. You know, we all have this desire, right? It's like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. But then it's like, but I want to take a nap, you know, at the same time, right? It's like, I want to accomplish this. You know, I want to, I want to get skinny, but I love tacos, right? And so, right, it's this back and forth. It's this back and forth thing in which you know you want to do better, right? You know, it's like, I, I want to get out of debt, but there's a sale on Amazon right now. So it's like, you know, it's, it's all that back and forth. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. That needs to be disciplined. Now, the flesh is two things. The flesh, guys, can be, look, our bodies. You know, you and I, you can I, uh, you know, we can be excited about do, to do anything. But at some point, we got to eat. At some point, we got to relax. At some point, we got to go to bed because our body is weak. We just can't go, 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 right? But also, there's an element of us that's called the flesh. It's internal, which is the part of us that it's sin, that it, it has a weak appetite. It does not want the things of God. It is easily satisfied with the things of this world. And so we have that double whammy. So interesting, he tells them the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
And we kind of see that in Jesus, don't we? The spirit of Jesus, him himself, he, there's no conflict here. He knows he's going to the cross. And so his spirit is willing to give himself. Jesus is willing to give himself as a ransom, as a sacrifice for us. But his flesh is showing weakness. See, Jesus was fully God, but also fully, truly man. And what you are hearing there, Father, if there is any way around this, there's an element of, we see this, there's this element of, a weakness that Jesus had never shown before. I really think that that's why the apostles so grieved. They were like, wait, what is going on here? They're seeing an element, a rawness of Jesus they've never seen. And so, and again, now is Jesus weak? How is, say that, you can go weird. I mean, an all-powerful God become weak? You know, well, what's going on here? No, I'm not saying that, but we're seeing also the fact that he is struggling. He is literally scared to death. He literally used that phrase in all three. Matthew, Mark, Luke, he says, I am sorrowful. I am deeply distressed. I am troubled, grieved to the point of death. He is scared out of his mind. That's an interesting thing, though. See, Jesus was scared. He experienced fear unlike any of you or any of I, any or I have ever experienced. And here's the crazy part. Jesus experienced fear and did not sin. Do you know that fear is not necessarily bad? You know that fear is a good thing. Think about it. What makes fear a good thing? Okay, there's the fear of the Lord is a Bible verse that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to take God seriously, right? But also fear is a God-given emotion. Again, talking about the cold feet that I was talking about, right? And so, I love you, babe. And so I was like, you know, so I was having cold feet. I was scared out of my mind that night. And I couldn't go to sleep. I couldn't rest my mind because I was scared out of my mind. Not because I'm like, is she going to wake up different the next day? You know, like I wasn't like, is, is this a trap? You know, I wasn't thinking like that at all. But I was scared because it's like, this is a big decision. This is huge. This matters. And so I was scared. Do you guys know that there is actually a term that you actually can be scared to death? That you can actually have be so shocked and so that you, you can die from being overwhelmed. That is what Jesus is feeling. Now, when you and I, fear is a good thing because fear caused, like fear that night was like, am I doing the right thing? Is she, am I doing the right thing? Is it, so fear is okay when it's causing you to process, to analyze, to really think and examine, to make sure, to be cautious. That's a good thing. But fear becomes sin when you believe the lie rather than the truth. And fear becomes a sin in which you now fail to put your faith in the character of God because when you are afraid of something, it's because technically you doubt him. Fear is connected to doubt. So Jesus at no point does his faith in his father actually diminish not even a, a percentage. But he is scared. He's not scared of dying. He's scared of what he's going to go through to get to that death. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that right now because, see, the cup that he was scared of, was the cup of wrath, the wrath of God. Now, if you look at this, guys, listen. In the Old Testament, there was always a theme, and this is always in the New, uh, back and forth. That you can tell it to be true. And that because of sin in this world, sin was rebellion against God. When you break the law, what has to happen? There's a punishment, has to, okay? I don't care who you are. If you broke the law and you went before a judge and the judge was like, you know what? You're a good guy. You've never done anything wrong ever. You know what? I know you just murdered two people, but this is the first time. You had a bad day. I bet you were stressed, maybe, you know? You know what? So we will let a whole lifetime of good over, we'll let this little thing go. No. And not even for the other side. Not even if it was a, a, a petty crime. A good judge would have to render some argument, you know, render a decision. And so because humanity has fallen, not just Adam and Eve, but all of us have fallen and sinned and, you know, we've fallen. So God has to, because he's a just God, he has to judge the world. If God allowed sinful people into heaven, it wouldn't be heaven anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? He has to judge sin, and so something needed to happen, and so the cup of wrath needed to be poured out on the guilty. And so Jesus 
The reason why he came, on the, to, came into the world was to testify to the truth of God, he said. I came to testify to the truth. How is he coming to testify to the truth? To show of who he is and what he has done. And part of testifying to the truth is testifying to the truth of the love of God, which also is connected to the wrath of God. See, guys, some of, this is a weird talk, topic to talk about. I was like, can God be angry? Oh, yeah. Oh, and wrath? 100%. In fact, the fact that he, he loves us so much, he has to have wrath. Guys, listen, tell you right now, pick one person that you love. I know you probably have a few. One person that you love. If somebody goes to try to hurt that one person that you love, are you not going to be wrathful at that moment? Yes or no? If someone's going to come after the person that you love, oh, there's a side of wrath that's going to come out of you. But is that wrath going to be because of the hatred of the person who's hurting your family member? No, it's out of love to protect the person you love. It's, it's actually a wrath connected to love. And so Jesus knew to go on the cross, I have to drink the cup of wrath. I have to experience the punishment of everyone's sin if they are to be saved. This is what he was scared about. This is what he was scared about. I mean, when you look at it, look back later. He talks about the cup a lot in Mark 10, 35, 45. Um, in Mark 10, two of his apostles, um, James and John, uh, they get his mama. All right, we talked about this last week. They get their mama to show up and says, hey, Jesus, let my two, my, let my two sons sit at the right hand of the left. That's like finding a show and I'm going to say, Tito, I need, I need Carlos and Antonio to be, you know, when, if, if you get elected president, I need Carlos to be, you know, vice president and Antonio to be, you know, chief of staff or something like that. That is something, whatever, you know. That's the same thing. And, and, Matt, and John and James, John and James felt like they deserved it. It was like they should be there. It should, it should be them. And you know what's interesting? When Jesus turns to James and John, he says, are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? I was like, wait, you want to sit next to me? Or can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Talking about the wrath of God. And they said, oh, yes. They did. And he says, oh, really? You know, no, Jesus says, oh, you will. Actually says, you will. Now, you don't get the cup, but they will have to take a sip. James was, pers James was executed. John was persecuted his whole life. And there's this element of following Christ that does have a sense of suffering that follows because we have a kingdom of darkness that does not, that wants to snuff out your light, that wants to snuff out the light. And so, I mean, it, the sip is not the cup. This is gulps. Very, very different. And so it was interesting that he was freaking out. But, but remember on Passover, I was telling you that they celebrate cups. Now, uh, by the time of Jesus, there was, there was um, four cups that they would use in the Passover ceremony. Each cup represented a promise that was found in Exodus. And this is, remember, when the whole Passover started. And the first cup was all connected to promises like this, that I will, uh, I will free you, the first cup. I will deliver you, second cup. Third cup, I will redeem you, I will bless you. And so there was elements in which a promise, a cup was lifted and raised to focus on the promise of God. When Jesus raises the third cup, the cup of redemption, this is the one in which he celebrates communion. So as Christians, check this out. If you've, you've probably celebrated communion in the past. Do you know that when Christians celebrate communion ever since that day, we, we don't have to celebrate the whole Passover Seder, which some do, but that's okay. We celebrate the third cup every time we take communion. The third cup was the cup of I will bless you. I will redeem you. I will save you was that cup. And that's the one Jesus takes bread and breaks it. This is my body given to you. And he raises the cup, blesses it, and says, this is my cup, the blood of the covenant that I will shed with you, for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the third cup. So every time we raise, and we're going to do it at the end of the service today, when we raise a glass, when we raise that cup, we are remembering those moments, God's promise that he will redeem us, he will save us. There was a fourth cup. Now, when you look at the Passover, Jesus picks up the fourth cup, but he actually does something different. The host always drinks first. Jesus raises the fourth cup, and this time he says, I will not drink this. Wait, that's weird. You're changing things up. Remember, the script has been going for about uh, 1,500 years. Jesus changes the script. I will not drink this fourth cup until the day, until the moment that I return. And, I, and in, the, in the new kingdom, when God, had, when Jesus returns a second time, you know what that cup was about? The promise 
was a cup of restoration, meaning I will protect you. The reason why Jesus says, I'm not going to drink this cup yet because I'm not going to drink it until the promise is fulfilled. So in heaven, when Christ returns, he will raise up the fourth glass. And he says, I told you, I protected you and brought you home, didn't I? And he will raise his glass and drink to celebrate a promise kept. That's the fourth cup. He didn't drink it because he had not fulfilled that promise yet. It's at that point, after that fourth cup, they get up, they go to the prayer, they're doing all of these things. But you know what's interesting in that event, over, over time, there was a fifth cup added, okay? There was a fifth cup added to the Passover Seder. The fifth cup was one in which was not drunk. Now, some, could, some consider, you know, this could have been uh, happening, you know, there's a lot of arguments even with Jewish stuff. So I don't want to get into this. But there was a cup that Jesus was talking about, a fifth cup in the garden. He was like, Lord, I don't want that cup. I don't want that cup. If there's a way around that cup, I don't want it. The Jews, when they celebrate Passover, guys, they're going to do it this week. They pour a fifth cup and they put it at the center of the table because it's a cup in which no one is allowed to drink. No one is able to drink it. They leave it at the center of the table, hoping that the prophet Elijah would come. And it's a sign of that because they believe that the prophet Elijah will come when the coming of the Messiah and he will answer all their questions. All right. Interesting. That fifth cup, no one touches. Now, why is this cup so horrible that is causing Jesus to shudder and fear the way that he is? Now, you got to remember this. Jesus, God is, I know this could be a little confusing for some, but listen, God is one God. But there's God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit. And so there's this three in one, you know, I, I like to give an analogy of we are three in one as well. God made us in his image. And so there's a part of you, let's say if you're a believer, you want to obey God. And there's a part of you called your flesh and your soul that wants to disobey God. And then there's another one that just wants to eat cake and take a nap, right? Those three things inside of you, right, all battling different wills, different desires. Well, here's the thing. And Jesus, all he has known forever, because God is an eternal God, all that he has known is the love of the Father. All he has known is the love of the Father. And now... The pregame jitters is starting to get there. Jesus knows within 48 hours, I got to start guzzling this cup. And he's freaking out because it means he's going to experience something he has never experienced before. All Jesus has known is the perfect love of the Father. And now that love has to be revoked and he has to drink the full wrath of the Father. That's, do you see why he didn't want to drink it? He wasn't scared. He wasn't freaking out. He wasn't having a weak moment, and he's going to run off into the distance. He loved his father too much, and the father loved him. He did not want to taste what the the wrath of the father would look like because the love is so sweet. And he knew that's why he was like saying, Dad, I love you too much. I can't. Sir, if there's no other way, then your will be done. That's why he was so It was disgusting for him. It was abhorrent to him. But yet he was obedient. He was obedient. There was no conflict of wills. Jesus wasn't having cold feet. He wasn't going to back out on any moment. He was dedicated to do this. In fact, we see it immediately after, right? The the, the people show up. He gives gives them a little kiss. Now they grab him. Now they're arresting Jesus. Peter starts freaking out. He starts going off. Every just, you know, he's just going off. He tries to, he lopped somebody's ear off, one of the officials, one of the, you know why he lopped his ear off? Dude was aiming for the head. I mean, Peter was just going to go off. You know, he would, that's it. Oh, this is my moment. This is my moment. And he was going for his head. He missed. He got his ear only, just nipped him. And at that moment, Jesus tells him, stop, stop, stop. Why? He was like saying, are you, this is in John, he says, Don't, don't, uh, are you going to stop me from drinking the cup? Stop it. So we saw Jesus was ready. He got out out of this prayer ready to drink this cup. He was, he was not excited about the experience, but he was ready. Now, remember, where was Jesus praying? There's a place. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all name the place. Gethsemane. It's called the Mount of Olives. Now, there, over here, you could put this, a private garden that Jesus prayed at. So probably a disciple that allowed Jesus to get alone in this private garden to pray and, um, you know, things like that. That's why he went there regularly. Um, but check this out. In, in an, um, this, was, this happened, 
Th this was there on the Mount of Olives. We still have this today. In fact, really interesting, I would have loved to know if Jesus was next to an olive press while he was praying. I don't think he was. I mean, he might be, but we know there were olive presses there. Now, if you look to the left, here's the thing about olives. I hate olives, number one, okay? I hate black olives. Loathe them, okay? So that's on you. Judge me all you want. I hate them. All right? That's, that's, that's the devil's creation. God didn't make those. All right, look. Everything on the left. You first off, you have to, in order to get olive oil, okay, to get the oil, you have to crush everything with a stone. And you roll it with a stone, with an animal, that's a hand. So you got to crush the pit. You got to crush everything. And once it's crushed, if you look to the right, that, that kind of little accordion thing looking there, those are many baskets. And you would shove all of the crushed olives into the baskets. You would stack the baskets and put weight on the top. And you can kind of see there's a little funnel there. Because now you are going to press the olives in order to get the oil. So now, let me show you, and they still do this to this day. There's three pressings that happen. The first pressing is very light. And after the first pressing, you get the most purest and the best high quality oil. This was the only oil that was allowed to use in the temple. For, it was used for religious services. This is the oil that went to royalty for the kings and queens. Um, it was very, very, very expensive to get that first press. Very expensive. Then the second press, they add more weight. And now when you add more weight, it actually releases a different kind of oil. This oil was used for food and medicine, cosmetics and perfume. It was actually edible. So if you ate it, it was okay. It's kind of like some essential oils. You know, there's some essential oils that you can eat and consume and it's good for you. That's the second pressing. It's good for you. It's safe to eat on the inside. Then the third one, now they put all the weight on it. And now you're just going to get every last little bit of that oil out of there. The third one was considered the cheapest of the oils. It was not good anymore to eat. If you eat the third one, you're going to get sick. And so they only used it for burning oil, like in lamps, um, sometimes for anointing a person, but not like, not like perfume, just kind of like a little dab, you know, kind of a thing like that. They would use it for anointing only. It was cheap. You know what the Greek word for the third pressing was called? Christos. What does that word sound like? Christ. The third, you know where we get that word Christos is this Greek word for Christ. And then Christos is the third pressing of the oil. And Christos means cheap. It means low grade. But again, it was used for anointing. Now see, the New Testament, for some of you who don't know, the New Testament was written in this Koine Greek. It was written in Greek. And so they needed to find a Greek word for the Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word they were looking for was the anointed one. Jesus, the Messiah. Guys, Jesus Christ, is, his name is not Jesus Christ because Joseph's last name was Christ. Okay? This is not a last name situation. It was an adjective. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah was the Hebrew word. The anointed one. The one, the Messiah. The one who would save us from our sins. And so here they give a really cheap word for Christ because he was the anointed one. But what's so beautiful about this is that, remember, the first one was for, was for who? The kings. The third pressing was for who? Everybody else. It was inexpensive. The poor could get this one. And tell me, is that not the anointed God? He is the Savior of everyone, rich and poor, young and old, everyone. He is a Savior for all people. And Christos means cheap. Salvation was expensive, but for us to experience it, it's cheap. It's belief. Beautiful, right? Interesting also, remember how many, how many pressings do they give oils? Three times. How many times did Jesus go and pause and pray? Three times. Three times Jesus goes, and he is, as he's praying, he's being pressed in each of his prayers. And the further along that he is praying— the heavier the weight becomes to the point that he is pressed so much. He is under so much pressure. Blood vessels in his brain start to pop. And out comes sweat mixed with blood. Look at how much he was pressed. Do you see that? Now, you've all been under pressure before, but that is a kind of pressure that no one has ever experienced. 
you and I would have been crushed under the first pressing. And yet after the third pressing in which all fear was removed and everything was taken out. After the third pressing, Jesus stood up and said, all right, it's go time. You and I would not even have survived the first. And he endured all three and the cross and some. Now, what I loved about this as well, guys, is that notice when Jesus, when, when, when the angel came, we read in Luke that the angel strengthened Jesus. He said, and he was under more anguish. And what did he do? He prayed even more fervently, meaning his pro- he never allowed his problem to get in the way of his prayers. That's a good lesson for us. We should never let our problems distract us from praying. The problem that he faced made him press in even more. And so that's what we're seeing here. He didn't abandon prayer because of his problem. He pressed in even more. And when he got up, he was committed. I was like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm going to drink the cup. In fact, John 19. I'm going to read John 19 in a second. Don't put it up yet. Look at this. He's on the cross. Jesus has begun. To, he's, he's being crucified at 9 a.m. At the same time, in the shadow of the temple, the 9 a.m. Passover ceremony is beginning. At 9 a.m., the, the high priest and the whole Passover celebration is happening. With, the, with this and with that and with the, the big sacrifice because every Passover, they would make one big sacrifice. And the goal was an innocent animal would be sacrificed, an innocent lamb would be sacrificed that committed no sin, that was perfect and would be sacrificed for the sins of others and that the sins of the people would, would be forgiven for a year, but they had to do it again. And again, every year, every year. Why every year? Because it was a symbol to show them that, listen, you are not enough. You, there's not enough animals in the world for you to sacrifice to forgive you of your sins. There's not enough that you can do. When the ceremony is happening in the, in the temple at 9 a.m., Jesus is, be, is being crucified at 9 a.m. as the perfect Passover lamb at the same time. Jesus is on the cross for about three hours. There's a lot that happens there. And then Matthew and Mark, and I think it was Luke, they say something happens at noon, at the halfway point, at 12 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, it says that darkness fills the land. Darkness now descends on Jerusalem because the light has failed. Now, this is not a, an eclipse. That is like a perfectly timed eclipse, all right? Darkness covers the whole land. Everyone's freaking out. Something's weird. This is not normal. What is happening at 12 o'clock? And the darkness lasted from 12 to 3. The wrath of God was being poured out on Jesus at 12 o'clock noon. Do you know what the wrath of God is? First off, for the wrath of God to be poured out, the sins, our sins, had to be poured onto Christ. Listen, the darkness that was showing was our darkness. It was a moment of, it's when the spiritual was so thick and concentrated in one specific geometric area that the spirit realm was manifesting in the physical as the sins of the world were being poured onto Christ in one, at one moment, all at once. Everything you and I have ever done, everything you and every person who has not only lived, but who will ever live. Everything that we have done and will do was poured on Jesus at that one moment. And here he is on the cross, not only consuming, embracing, taking the sins. In fact, you know what? The, in the, the way that the Jews would do this, God instituted this. You would have to take the animal and you would go to the animal and you would put your forehead on the animal's forehead as a symbol of saying, I'm transferring my sins onto this animal is going to be punished for something that it didn't do. It's going to be punished for what I did. And you transfer it over. At that moment on the cross, as Jesus is pinned to wood, our sins are being transferred over into him. And he, with open arms, is taking it all in. Taking it all in. And not only that, but now the judgment of God would be poured out as well. That's why Friday, I, I, wanna, I don't have enough time to talk about, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? I got to leave that for Friday because we don't got time. But it's in that moment in that all of it was being poured and he is guzzling 
guzzling the wrath of God all at that moment, all at once. Our sins and the punishment of sin. And then John writes this in John 19. Now we can put it up. Look at John 19, 28. After this, and what was the after this? After three hours of having to drink from the cup of wrath, straight. After this, Jesus, knowing, look at this. He knew in John 19, he said, in John 19, he says, knowing all these things, knowing it is now finished, meaning the cup of wrath has been drunk. The, 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 the replacement of, of sin has been made. The, the atonement of our sin has been done. He knew. He knew it was over. No one else did. He knew it was over. And so when all things are finished, at the, that the scriptures might be accomplished, he said, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Listen, I just drank some coffee not too long ago, and it dried out my throat, and now I had to guzzle water like crazy. I'm an idiot for doing that. It dehydrated my throat because the coffee does that. I needed a drink because I'm about to talk. Jesus says, I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. So they give him a vessel full of vinegar. So they put a sponge full of vinegar upon hyssop, which is a branch, and they brought it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received it, meaning he drunk the vinegar, he then says, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Now, why did Jesus have to say that? Because he's the only one who knew it was finished. Three hours of guzzling the wrath of God. He has been on the cross now for six hours. He is dehydrated. He has been abused and beaten. No food, no water, probably going on 48 hours or so. He has nothing left. And he just wants a little sip of water just to coat his vocal cords one last time. That's all. He couldn't talk. We've all had that. <clears throat> and you have that drink. I'm like, okay, now I'm better. Your vocal cords are restored. There was a drink that Jesus didn't drink before. Two times he was offered something to drink. The first time it was vinegar mixed with gall. You know what that was? A pain reliever. While he was experiencing the wrath of God and screaming in agony, he was, they were offering him pain reliever. They would offer it to people on the cross to, you know, like when people are suffering, right? They give them that, that, that hey, let's give them medication so they're, that at least they can die in peace. Jesus refused to drink the pain reliever. He wanted it all. No pain reliever. Nothing. He wanted it. He wanted it all. This time, he allows the drink. Why? By the way, hyssop was given to the, used over in the Passover lamb ceremony as well. He wants to coat his vocal cords because he's about to say something and he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to hesitate and he wants to be in full voice. He coats his vocal cords one last time and he drinks that gulp and he takes a breath and declares with everything he has, as scripture says, it is finished and declares what he knew and he declares it's done. I did it. I, it's, it's gone. I drank it all. It is finished no more no more it is finished i did it and then he gave up the ghost and then died at that moment what's even more beautiful about that statement you know who was declaring it is finished at three o'clock at the same time jesus yelled it from the cross that was a priestly declaration at the same time in the temple the priest has finished sacrificing the Passover lamb, and the priest would declare to the congregation, it is finished. The Passover lamb has been slain, and the forgiveness of your sins is good for a year. You got to come back in 365 days. Jesus declared as the high priest, it is finished, but this, this is not going to last a year. This lasts for eternity. And that it is finished was not, all, not only was it a declaration, for, a priestly declaration, it was also a legal declaration of the time. When someone declared, it is finished, they meant, your debt has been paid in full. So Jesus on the cross declares, I did it. Your debt has been paid in full, all of it. I drank every bit of it. It is done. Now remember, guys, the Jews, they have a center cup. And where do they put the cup? At the center of the table. Why? Because they say none of us are worthy enough to drink it. Only Elijah. And he will come when the Messiah comes. He will come when the Messiah comes and answer all the questions that we have. 
How sad is it that there will be people this week that will have a cup there waiting for a Messiah to come and drink it and to answer all of their questions when the Messiah has already come and has already drunk the cup that you and I cannot drink and he has already done it and they're going to stare at a full cup waiting for something that has already happened. Oh, may your hearts go out to the Jews and pray for them this week that their eyes may be open. But so may ours. So may ours, because that, that, you know what, that final fifth cup was to a promise. Remember, every cup had a promise, and the fifth cup went to a fifth promise, and he made it in Exodus, and the promise was, I will bring you in. I will bring you into the family. I will bring you in. At what cost? For you to come in, I have to drink the cup of the wrath of God so that you can be made members of the family of God. Guys, we, we have that phrase here, forever familia. I heard Marilyn, you said, hey, well, good morning, my familia, good morning. At what cost did that come? We were made members of, we can be made members of the family of God by faith in Christ because he drank the full cup of wrath. Guys, listen. We now, what is the cup we drink? The cup of redemption, the cup of blessing. We drink the cup of blessing because Jesus drank the cup of our curse. He drank the cup of hell so that we could taste heaven. That's what he did. He drank our cup. He drank our cup of hell so that we can drink and taste what heaven was like. Jesus experienced temporary separation from the love of God so that we can experience an eternal separation from the wrath of God. What a mighty God and generous God we serve. Look at what he did so that we could stand even here and worship him and love him. Look at what he did. He drank our cup for us, and then he is waiting in anticipation to drink that fourth cup he set aside. For when the promise is done, and he has acquired a people unto himself, and Christ will raise his glass upon his return and send, guys, welcome home. Welcome home. And so now that leaves us to do what? But to continue to drink our cup. See, you and I, our our, our pressing is different than Jesus' pressing. It's different. But because he was pressed to a beyond measure, we can have hope. Remember, Jesus was weak, and what happened? An angel came and strengthened him. We are weak as well. In fact, look at Psalms 119, the biggest chapter in the Bible. Psalms 119, it's the psalmist says, and it's all about the word of God. And look what Psalms 119 says. You can put it on. It says this, my soul melts with heaviness. I have sorrow and I have, to, I, have, I have all this weight. So Lord, strengthen me according to your what? According to your word. And guys, what could give you more strength? Tell me something else whether, what, besides the word that Jesus declared, it is finished. But not only those words, but all of his word. This was written before Jesus. And guys, listen, you and I, we are weak. We struggle. We need to be strengthened. And what are we strengthened with? By the very word of God, who accomplished the word of God, the scriptures. In fact, even in in Ephesians chapter 6, this is all he would say. You know what Paul would tell the church? Therefore, be strengthened. Be strengthened. This is the Old Testament, what he says in Psalms. He says, be strengthened in the Lord. And how are you strengthened? Put on the armor of God. And what is the armor? Truth. The word of God is truth. And then he says, put on, hold the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit. See, look, praying and praying in the Bible go hand in hand. You cannot pray without God's word. You cannot... Read God's word without prayer. They both go together. And what Paul is saying is the same thing that the psalmist says. Listen, you and I have to keep taking sips from this cup right here. This is what gives us strength. This is what replenishes us. This, it is God's word which shows us his nature. This is what strengthens us. And it is a cup that we are supposed to sip and pass. Because when Jesus held the cup of redemption and he drank it, he gave it to the apostle. The apostle had to sip it and pass it to the next one. Sip it, pass it to the next one. Sip it, pass it to the next one. You and I are called to sip from the cup of the blessings of God from eternal life and offer it to a dying world and say, are you tired? Are you thirsty? Are you looking for something? Then here, look what Jesus has offered me. I offer it to you. Believe in Jesus and receive the same eternal life. This is for you too. It's not just for me to keep. It's for you. 
We get, to, we get to drink the cup of blessing because Jesus drank the cup of our curse. And we never have to experience that ever. Unless you don't believe. See, if you choose to, if you don't believe in Jesus, what you're saying is, I'll take the cup. I'll take the cup. And you will have all of eternity and you will never get down to the bottom. Which makes what Jesus did even more. Jesus, how did Jesus drink an eternal cup in three hours? You and I, if we have to drink this cup, it would be an eternity and we would never get to the bottom of it. Yet Jesus drank the cup of wrath to the very last drop. He, in three hours, he drank everyone's hell in three hours. So that we could have him. So that we could also now raise our glass to the one who raised, who drunk our glass. We can lift up our glass and bless the one who drank the cup of our curse. And that's what I want to encourage us to do right now. If you have never believed, grab a hold of that cup. That cup is for you too. It is enough. There is enough of the cup of the love of God to cover my sin, your sins, all of our sins. But you've got to believe and drink. And now when we do, we get to raise now this glass and lift it to the Lord. I want to finish by, by reading Psalm, Psalms 24, verse 7 and 10. This is talked about to the King of glory, and this is uh, the, the psalmist David is looking into the future, and he is seeing a prophetic vision of Jesus as a conquering king, entering into his kingdom with everyone that is believed in tow. And he, he reads in Psalms 24, 7 and 10. He then challenges the world, and he challenges everyone and says, lift up. As the king is approaching the city, he says, lift up your heads, you gates. Ra raise up the ancient doors for the king of glory is coming in. Don't have the door closed. Open the gates. Let the king of glory in. For who is this king of glory, he asks. It is the Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. The Lord uh, lift up your heads, you gates. Raise up, you ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. And who is this king of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. His name is Jesus, the king of kings. And so, in the same way, the psalmist looked into the future and saw it. He says, raise up the doors and let the king of glory in. I tell you now to raise your, you know, raise your hearts, open your hearts, and let the king continually into your hearts and bless his name for what he has done for us. To the last drop, he did it. It is finished. And now we get to bless him forever for it.